You're listening to the weekly Bible lesson from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. This is the lesson for Sunday, October 18, 2020. Subject, Doctrine of Atonement. The golden text is from Matthew. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The responsive reading is from Second Peter. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, Seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I will read from the Bible. Leviticus. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord, and lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered him to keep, or in fellowship, or in a thing taken away by violence, or hath deceived his neighbor, or have found that which was lost and lieth concerning it, and sweareth falsely, in any of all these that a man doeth, sinning therein, then it shall be, because he hath sinned, and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took violently away, or the thing which he hath deceitfully gotten, or that which was delivered him to keep, or the lost thing which he found, or all that about which he hath sworn falsely, he shall even restore it in the principle, and shall add the fifth part more thereto and give it unto him to whom it appertaineth in the day of his trespass offering. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram without blemish out of the flock, with thy estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord, and it shall be forgiven him for anything of all that he hath done in trespassing therein. John Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. 
in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go, and sin no more. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. For he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, Ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him. Luke. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer 
and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Romans But God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. I will now read correlative passages from the Christian Science Textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy. Atonement is the exemplification of man's unity with God, whereby man reflects divine truth, life, and love. Jesus of Nazareth taught and demonstrated man's oneness with the Father, and for this we owe him endless homage. The atonement of Christ reconciles man to God, not God to man. For the divine principle of Christ is God. And how can God propitiate himself? Jesus aided in reconciling man to God by giving man a truer sense of love, the divine principle of Jesus' teachings. And this truer sense of love redeems man from the law of matter, sin, and death by the law of spirit, the law of divine love. Final deliverance from error, whereby we rejoice in immortality, boundless freedom, and sinless sense, is not reached through paths of flowers nor by pinning one's faith without works to another's vicarious effort. Whosoever believeth that wrath is righteous, or that divinity is appeased by human suffering, does not understand God. Justice requires reformation of the sinner. Mercy cancels the debt only when justice approves. Wisdom and love may require many sacrifices of self to save us from sin. One sacrifice, however great, is insufficient to pay the debt of sin. The atonement requires constant self-immolation on the sinner's part. That God's wrath should be vented upon his beloved Son is divinely unnatural. Such a theory is man-made. The atonement is a hard problem in theology, but its scientific explanation is that suffering is an error of sinful sense which truth destroys, and that eventually both sin and suffering will fall at the feet of everlasting love. Every pang of repentance and suffering, every effort for reform, every good thought and deed will help us to understand Jesus' atonement for sin and aid its efficacy. But if the sinner continues to pray and repent, sin and be sorry, he has little part in the atonement in the at one with God. For he lacks the practical repentance, 
which reforms the heart and enables man to do the will of wisdom. Those who cannot demonstrate, at least in part, the divine principle of the teachings and practice of our Master have no part in God. If living in disobedience to Him, we ought to feel no security, although God is good. Though demonstrating his control over sin and disease, the great teacher by no means relieved others from giving the requisite proofs of their own piety. He worked for their guidance, that they might demonstrate this power as he did and understand its divine principle. Implicit faith in the teacher and all the emotional love we can bestow on him will never alone make us imitators of him. We must go and do likewise, else we are not improving the great blessings which our Master worked and suffered to bestow upon us. As the individual ideal of truth, Christ Jesus came to rebuke rabbinical error and all sin, sickness, and death, to point out the way of truth and life. This ideal was demonstrated throughout the whole earthly career of Jesus, showing the difference between the offspring of soul and of material sense, of truth and of error. If we have triumphed sufficiently over the errors of material sense to allow soul to hold the control, we shall loathe sin and rebuke it under every mask. Only in this way can we bless our enemies, though they may not so construe our words. We cannot choose for ourselves, but must work out our salvation in the way Jesus taught. If Christ, truth, has come to us in demonstration, no other commemoration is requisite, for demonstration is Emmanuel, or God with us. And if a friend be with us, Why need we memorials of that friend? If all who ever partook of the sacrament had really commemorated the sufferings of Jesus and drunk of his cup, they would have revolutionized the world. If all who seek his commemoration through material symbols will take up the cross, heal the sick, cast out evils, and preach Christ or truth to the poor, the receptive thought, they will bring in the millennium. Our baptism is a purification from all error. Our Eucharist is spiritual communion with the one God. Our bread, which cometh down from heaven, is truth. Our cup is the cross. Our wine, the inspiration of love, the draft our master drank and commended to his followers. The purification of sense and self is a proof of progress. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The Pharisees claimed to know and to teach the divine will, but they only hindered the success of Jesus' mission. Even many of his students stood in his way. If the Master had not taken a student and taught the unseen verities of God, he would not have been crucified. 
The determination to hold spirit in the grasp of matter is the persecutor of truth and love. The efficacy of the crucifixion lay in the practical affection and goodness it demonstrated for mankind. The truth had been lived among men, but until they saw that it enabled their master to triumph over the grave, his own disciples could not admit such an event to be possible. After the resurrection, even the unbelieving Thomas was forced to acknowledge how complete was the great proof of truth and love. If truth is overcoming error in your daily walk and conversation, you can finally say, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Because you are a better man. This is having our part in the at one with truth and love. Christians do not continue to labor and pray, expecting, because of another's goodness, suffering, and triumph, that they shall reach his harmony and reward. If the disciple is advancing spiritually, he is striving to enter in. He constantly turns away from material sense and looks towards the imperishable things of spirit. If honest, he will be in earnest from the start and gain a little each day in the right direction till at last he finishes his course with joy. I will now read the three daily duties by Mary Baker Eddy as given in the church manual. Daily prayer. It shall be the duty of every member of this church to pray each day, Thy kingdom come. Let the reign of divine truth, life, and love be established in me and rule out of me all sin. And may thy word enrich the affections of all mankind and govern them. A rule for motives and acts. Neither animosity nor mere personal attachment should impel the motives or acts of the members of the Mother Church. In science, divine love alone governs man, and a Christian scientist reflects the sweet amenities of love in rebuking sin, in true brotherliness, charitableness, and forgiveness. The members of this church should daily watch and pray to be delivered from all evil, from prophesying, judging, condemning, counseling, influencing, or being influenced erroneously. Alertness to duty. It shall be the duty of every member of this church to defend himself daily against aggressive mental suggestion and not be made to forget nor to neglect his duty to God, to his leader, and to mankind. By his works he shall be judged, and justified or condemned. And from Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy Christian Scientists be a law to yourselves that mental malpractice cannot harm you, either when asleep or when awake. This Bible lesson is prepared by the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent. It is comprised of scriptural quotations from the King James Bible 
and correlative passages from the Christian Science Textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, by Mary Baker Eddy. For more information, please visit our website, plainfieldcs.com. Thank you for listening, and have a blessed day.